from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell and I'm in Melbourne where I've been commentating off tube as the industry phrase goes on the first men's ashes test which is taking place in Brisbane but border rules mean that the Channel 7 team I'm working for the TV network we can't get into Brisbane so hence doing it from here but it has not stopped us being thoroughly absorbed by a dramatic and highly entertaining and eventful opening few days of the ashes the only sadness Jim is that I'm not able to sit and commentate alongside you just yet Yes, Ali. Hopefully in Adelaide we managed to sort out all these protocols of getting from one state to another and you'll be joining us on the radio. But uh, I'm here in Sydney, like Ali, calling it off tube from Brisbane. Weather looks lovely in Brisbane when the sun shines. Um, you get a suntan in the studio, I, I suppose, and certainly the air con's working very nicely. And uh, so is the test match so far for Australia. It looks like uh, they're on top. I think you could say that. Confidently, couldn't you, Jerry? Very one sided so far, Jim. Hello, everybody. I'm Sharma I'm Sharma for All India Radio in Ahmedabad today, where I am because of a charity golf tournament that I'm assisting. And of course, thereafter, I moved to Mumbai for an Indian tennis, uh, Premier Tennis League. So, plenty of travel for me this one at a time. But sad, of course, like Alison said, that we're not all together or even on the tube, off tube, commentating on something or the other together as a stump team. But it's wonderful to be here in Ahmedabad. There's some travel restrictions that are beginning to surface, but uh, I'm glad that we're sort of almost normal in our part of the world. And of course, there's plenty of cricket news uh, apart from the ashes. What with the Indian cricket captaincy in question once again, where Sharma seems to have taken over all the white ball captaincy, as we did guess some time back. Yeah, that's right. And I'm, I'm glad you have managed to watch a little bit of the ashes cricket charu in, in and amongst all your, your other many activities. <laughs> Well, we have to start by talking about the men's ashes and it's been a build up unlike any other this particular series. But boy, when it did get underway, the start was unlike any other that we had seen in living memory. Rory Burns bowled around his legs by Mitchell Stark, first ball of the entire series. It was incredible. And that was after England captain Joe Root had won the toss and opted to bat first. Uh, Jim, before we go any deeper, you were commentating on that moment for the ABC. What did you feel? What did you think? What was your emotion and, and the atmosphere in the Gabba when that happened? Well, it was a knockout. We're used to first over, first ball uh, incidents, remarkable um, deliveries, Harmison's wide, Michael Slater's cut off to Freitas some years ago uh, that lashed the ball to the boundary. But this, was just so emphatic. Poor old Rory Burns. He didn't know what was going on as he staggered across his stumps and almost fell over to the swinging Yorker, brilliantly bowled by Mitchell Stark. Yes, uh, the most dramatic start you could imagine to a test match and something you very rarely see in a game of cricket. I have to say, I just was expecting Burns to follow it and clip it off his legs for four. First mm -hmm. ball, not the case. But tell you what, things didn't get too much better for England because the wickets kept falling after that. And England were rolled for 147 and Pat Cummins taking a fifer on his captaincy debut. There's been controversy as well in the first couple of days. First over the non-selection by England of both their veteran fast bowlers and leading wicket takers, Stuart Broad and James Anderson. And then when it seemed that David Warner had been bowled by Ben Stokes early on the second day, the delivery was checked and it was shown to be a no ball. That wasn't really the controversial part. The controversial part was the fact that Stokes had bowled no balls, multiple no balls in the lead up, and yet they hadn't been spotted. And later it turned out to have been a technology failure. The on field umpire was meant to be calling the no balls, and yet they weren't called. Warner went on to make 94. Ollie Robinson grabbed two wickets in two balls, so we had an Ashes hat trick ball. And then Australia lost four for 29, either side of T on day two. But then, well, the Aussies worked their way back into the commanding position just when England threatened and perhaps had a little chink of being able to work their way back into the match. But Travis Head was incredible for a century in 85 balls and pushing that Australian lead up and up towards the 200 mark, just as England's bowling attack started to look depleted with injury. Charu. 
has come to you. We've heard from Jim. Just overall, I mean, Ashes are often eventful. There's been a lot going on in the first couple of days. Well, yes, and one does feel a little if sad is the word for, for England for starting out so badly, but also the fact that the attack is depleted. It looks like it'll be 1-0 for Australia. Remember our our, um, uh, our call on stump was that Australia was probably 3-1 in the series, and they started off knowing that they're trying to prove us right. So yeah, the, the lack of bowling options for um, uh, England, of course, are a big concern, and I hope these guys recover quickly enough. Also a little disappointing, maybe it's early part of the test, so Leach wasn't too effective for England at all, and that option hasn't also worked. But Head, what can I say? You know, he's in the mold, at least the knock that he played this time, which is a match winner perspective because if you score slowly there are times when you amass a lot of runs but also give the opposition enough chance but scoring quickly is just so vital in test matches now and uh, he did very well Travis Head. However uh, I think England have a minor chance of coming back but I, I think Australia are too far ahead now and I feel for you Alison because it was a very poor start. I cannot remember an English team coming to Australia and not playing a match of any sort before the first test. And that showed, I mean, the first day, Australia was flawless in the field, did not make a mistake, took every catch. The second day, England missed a few chances, crucially the Rory Burns catch, and a few run-out chances. Um, you know, it was, it was like they were throwing at a needle, not a set of stumps um, on a couple of occasions, and that could have made the difference. And the no ball you mentioned, of course, but um, there was no Stuart Broad. I mean, this is... Madness, absolute madness, and there, sh there should be a royal commission at the end of this game as to why he wasn't picked, because th that was a balmy, uh, excuse me, fellas, uh, selection. So let's hone in on that for a moment, because we know with the England team, for a start, who takes responsibility for selection. It is the England coach, Chris Silverwood. He is the selector. There's no national selector who sits outside of the team. It is Chris Silverwood who chooses the 11 in conjunction, of course, with Joe Root. So it is their call. There is nobody else to look at. So he will have those questions to answer. And we will get at least the direct explanation from the England coach uh, at the end of the match. But Chari, could you get your head around leaving out both of those players with more than 1,100 wickets between them? Well, I, so I'm only presuming that there's some kind of niggle or injury because it cannot possibly be on form or on reputation, and especially the first test, because there's so much psychology involved in the first test, the psychology involved in the entire Ashes. And to not go with the two spearheads in the very first test match defies any kind of logic. Now, I wonder whether with Stuart Broad, given that he's coming back from a, a pretty serious calf injury, that they genuinely doubted or didn't feel confident that he was match fit, given, as you say, Jim, the lack of match practice. Do you think that that, though, also influenced Joe Root's decision at the toss, given that they had decided to go with Wokes in the team? I don't think it was a poor decision at the toss. It didn't work out for them, as it turned out. Um, but it's hard to anticipate conditions. And they decided, obviously, with uh, Leach playing, that, you know, they're bowling last, the ball might be turning, whatever. I mean, I feel for Leach as well. He's taken a thumping in this game, but he hasn't played any cricket. What did he play? Six first-class matches during the year. So no wonder he's underdone, apart from, from all the others. So things have worked out so far wretchedly for England, and uh, you would hope that they can recover. It was interesting to notice that this group of bowlers as a combination have never played together for England before. It's the first time, right? Um, and it probably wasn't the appropriate time at the beginning of an Ashes series to be leaving out both your star bowlers. And um, I, I'm still scratching my head, as I say, uh, that neither of Anderson nor Broad were playing. You play your best at 11 to start a series, surely. Next on Stumps, during the recent Men's T20 World Cup, there was a lot of talk about the coin toss and how most teams who won the toss ended up winning the game. In fact, 30 out of 45 matches, so that's about two thirds, were won by the team who won the coin toss, including the final when Australia beat New Zealand. And it was a point, Charu, that you raised here on Stumps at the time. In a more umbrella, umbrella sense, uh, it was rather disappointing to have teams chasing win a lot more comfortably. So, 
you know, it just sort of dampened the possibilities of this T20 World Cup because we know it's close enough anyway. It's like, a, you know, you toss a coin. But by losing the toss and then having to uh, bat first just seemed to be, you know, I, I'm sure the teams were very disappointed at losing the toss. So I, I think that was a, a major collective disappointment, that the fact that it was so overwhelmingly uh, favoring teams that chased. Well, back in 2018, you might remember that the ICC Cricket Committee considered removing the toss from the World Test Championship completely, but they decided instead to urge member nations to produce better pitches. Now, the county championship in the UK went one step further, and between 2016 and 2019, they gave the visiting team the opportunity to scrap the toss and simply choose it to bowl first. And that was an attempt to stop clubs preparing excessively damp and seam-friendly pitches and to encourage spin bowling as well. Four years later, though, the England and Wales Cricket Board decided that that hadn't worked. But now, a new suggestion could transform coin toss as we know it. Now, Haris Aziz is an associate professor at the University of New South Wales and joins us now to tell us a little bit more. Haris, welcome to Stumped. So you've incorporated cricket into your professional life now with this theory. So come on, tell us, what is this coin toss theory that you have? The proposal is called the toss, propose and choose method. We have the toss as usual. Uh, the second step is called propose. And in this particular step, uh, the captain that loses a toss uh, makes a proposal. In particular, the captain describes a given number of bonus or handicap runs to neutralize the disadvantage of bowling versus batting first. Uh, I can give you a simple example. Uh, let's say that batting first is a disadvantage. In that case, the team batting first will get a proposed number of runs in the extras column. And finally, we have the third step, uh, which is called choose, where a choice is made by the captain who actually won the toss, whether to bat or bowl first. But with the caveat that the team that takes a disadvantage option also gets the proposed bonus runs. Ooh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is clearly an, an artifice that may or may not work, but um, perhaps he could tell us a little bit more. Um, the captain who loses the toss has an advantage, does he not? Doesn't that defeat the purpose, or is it all about alleged fairness in what you're coming up with? Yes, so it's, it really is all about fairness. The whole idea behind the method is to ensure that no side feels that they are disadvantaged. So I agree with you that uh, the method is designed to help the captain that loses a toss. It does give that captain an opportunity to neutralize the disadvantage. But if you note the order of the steps I explained, the final decision of which option to choose is still with the captain that actually wins the toss. So in that sense, the lucky captain is perfectly satisfied as well. Just how do you work out how many runs you're giving the team batting first? It must depend on the location. Um, and um, it just sounds to me as though it's going to make it much more complicated. I mean, Duckworth Lewis is complicated enough. Uh, I agree. Some people might say, why complicate a simple thing as a toss? Uh, you don't need this method uh, for low stakes games, a game in the park or a game in the backyard or the local club, although that can get pretty serious as well. Uh, however, what you don't want is that the final of the ICC Test Championship or the ODI World Cup is heavily affected by the toss outcome. Uh, I'll add one more comment. Uh, cricket, as you know, has already been open to more complex methods such as uh, Duckworth Lewis. So relatively speaking, my method is a simple and minimal change. Well, Harris, I, uh, I, I, we've touched upon this and, and uh, Jim mentioned this, but the subjectivity in the weightage that the losing captain is given, you know, is, is a little perplexing for me. I mean, who is to decide that this pitch, if you bat first and is not good for you, uh, the, the, the team that chases should be given, or the team that bats first should be given 10 runs more or 5 or 15? It sounds a little complicated, but maybe you have an algorithm for it. However, I will ask that is this theory more effective in red ball cricket as much as cricket? Or, or are you recommending that it happens across the board in, in white ball cricket as well to neutralize advantage, disadvantage of the toss? Sure, I'll, I'll answer your second question first. Uh, uh, firstly, the method is designed for any kind of format. Uh, it was inspired by the changes in conditions in T20s during, in Dubai. Uh, but as you know, the, the conditions and pitches, they change even more in test matches over the course of five days. So it's certainly suitable for test matches. 
And regarding your second, uh, the question about how do you decide? So cricket is a highly analytical game. Uh, captains make all sorts of decisions. So this is really a decision which has to be made by the, the captain that loses a toss. So if the captain really doesn't care about uh, batting versus bowling first or is completely indifferent, then the captain can simply resort to zero bonus runs, in which case we are back to the normal toss. It's only in certain conditions where the captain feels that there is a certain advantage of batting versus bowling first, that captain can do a, a thought experiment to, to see how many runs are reasonable. Uh, a simple thought experiment would be, would I bat to bowl first? Would I bat to bowl first if I had five more runs, 10 more runs? And at certain point, you would say, okay, uh, I think I'm roughly indifferent among these two options. And that would be a good indicator for the captain to make. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Harris Aziz from the University of New South Wales. Thank you so much for joining us. Do you think it's a winner, Jim, Cherry? Could, could you see something like that? Or are we going to keep the toss as it's always been forever? I hope so. What you've got to do is have the same conditions for the team batting second and first. If you play day-night games, you haven't. So just play all the games during the day. Simple. Yeah, it, it's it's fascinating to think, isn't it? Would you, you know, what value do you put on fifty runs? What value do you put on fifteen runs as a as a head start? And that just feels so foreign, doesn't it, in cricket for a team to have a head start? Yes, there there is penalty runs as a concept, but that is barely ever actually put into place um, or actioned in cricket. So it feels very foreign to offer uh, a, a bargain. Although, of course, we know that. Um, declarations and targets and things like that get often discussed you know, behind the scenes. So is this sort of different to that even? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure from my perspective that it will catch on. Although, of course, there is already an alternate to the coin toss, isn't it? And it's called the bat flip. Though it's still a toss in a way. It is, isn't it? <laughs> which, which they use in the big bash, which they use in the big bash. Well, that is all we've got time for here on Stumped on All India Radio. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter. We're at BBC WS Sport and use the hashtag BBC Stumped. And check us out on YouTube too. Go to BBC World Service on YouTube. So my thanks to Cherry Sharma, Jim Maxwell, and of course to you all for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. From the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio, this is Stumped.